Welcome. This is George Della with Power for Today Prophetic Ministries. We're coming to you tonight with our first and third Tuesday Bible study. And uh, we're in the midst of a series we're doing on the Kingdom of Power. And uh, before we get started tonight, we want to have a word of prayer and uh, ask God to, to uh, open the word to our understanding and give us revelation because we uh, uh, seriously need God to uh, uh, really begin to move in the body of Christ and uh, give us an understanding of this great salvation is given to us because it seems like the further we get away uh, from the first century church, uh, the, the less we're looking like it. And uh, we're seeing less and less fruits uh, that ought to be manifested in the body of Christ today. And so uh, this is so key uh, to that. And uh, we need to get back to the basics, back to the foundational doctrines of Scripture, get back in the Word and prayer, and back in the Holy Ghost, uh, whereby God can bring forth the true fruits of the kingdom. So as we pray tonight, let's... Uh, uh, I want to just pray a couple of scriptures, uh, particularly in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1 through 7, uh, because this is one of the um, uh, real keys uh, to revival and the things that God wants to do, and that is uh, imparting that love for God's Word back into our heart, where we will really uh, be a generation that seeks God through His Word and prayer, uh, so that... Uh, uh, that word can change us. So let's pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, as we, we come together tonight, uh, we just ask that your Holy Spirit be with us to lead us and guide us into all truth, to teach us and uh, produce the fruits of, of your kingdom in our lives uh, through the word and the spirit. And according to your word in Proverbs chapter 2, Lord, we pray that you would give to us a heart to receive your words and to treasure your commands within us so that we will incline our ears to wisdom and apply our hearts to understanding that we would cry out for discernment and lift up our voices for understanding to seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasure so that we might understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For it is you who gives wisdom from your mouth comes knowledge and understanding for you have stored these things up uh, uh, for the upright, for your children. And Father, we also pray that uh, we would receive your word as it is, not the word of men, but the word of God, the word of truth, which also effectively works in those who believe. We declare tonight, Lord, we believe and we receive. We welcome your word and we pray, O oh God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that that word will produce the fruits of your kingdom in our lives in Jesus' mighty name. Give us that spirit of wisdom and revelation to know you better, Lord. And uh, teach us the truth that will set us free in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as I've been saying, we've been uh, uh, speaking about this kingdom of power. And uh, really, when you look at it through the New Testament scriptures, you'll find that the power we're talking about is, is on two fronts. One it is God's power that produces uh, a true saving work, a true redemptive work that changes us into a new creation. And then once we come into that place of sonship, of being the sons and daughters of God, they're led by the Spirit of God, that power continues to work in us and through us as we are transfigured into the image of Christ, but also uh, to show forth the manifestation of the Holy Spirit that God has given to each one of us. Uh, so that others will believe, uh, just as Jesus, uh, when, when Jesus was walking on, on the earth in the flesh, he says, if you don't believe me for the things I tell you, then believe me for the works that I do. The works were proof that Jesus was the Son of God. The works were proof that Jesus was in the Father, and the Father uh, was in the Son. And so uh, God wants us now to uh, bear that same witness, that testimony, that we're in Christ, and Christ is in us, that we're in the Spirit and the Spirit's in us. And, and God is still manifesting Himself upon this earth that others will believe. And in believing, they too can receive eternal life. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, uh, Paul said this. He says, And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of man, 
but in the power of God. And, and when you really understand what that scripture is saying, God's kingdom comes in power. We, we, we really understand we need real discernment in this day because we're warned over and over again throughout the scriptures, throughout the New Testament especially, of false prophets, false teachers, false brethren, the, the devil coming as uh, uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, uh, sheep's clothing and uh, uh, coming as an angel of light to deceive uh, uh, people, to lead them astray. And uh, we were warned over and over and over again in almost every book of the New Testament uh, that these things would increase in the last days, that one of the greatest characteristics of a last day church would be deception, people being deceived and uh, being given a false gospel and uh, uh, and, and we're seeing it happen right before our eyes. And uh, uh, what Paul is saying here, talking about the kingdom of God coming in power, uh, uh, we have to really have discernment because you can be a motivational speaker. You can be a really good speaker and not have the anointing of God that's going to change lives. And we're seeing that happening all over the body of Christ today. And we need, need that discernment. God's kingdom comes in power. It's the power of the cross, the power of the gospel, the power of Christ, the power of his name, the power of God. Uh, everything that God does uh, through this redemptive work and, and uh, through this kingdom that he brings upon this earth and in us is uh, wrought by his power. It is evidenced by God's power. It's God's power that truly makes us into a new creation. And... Uh, we have to understand that everything about uh, this salvation is rooted in that power. And without that power, there is no real salvation. Because again, it takes God's hand, it takes His work, His power, His energy to literally uh, transform us into a new creation. Uh, it, he uses the Greek word uh, metamorphosis. That's the supernatural power of God uh, to change us into a new creation from Adam into Christ, uh, just like a, cater uh, a, a caterpillar into a butterfly. Uh, we're no longer look like a caterpillar, act like a caterpillar, uh, uh, because we're brought forth into a brand new creation. And that's what he uh, typifies uh, for us when he talks about us being conformed to the image of Christ, being taken from Adam, a man of sin, uh, with a sin nature, and we go through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ to come out like that butterfly. We come out as a new creation uh, in the image of Christ. And uh, when we really look at this New Testament scriptures that talk about what a Christian is, what this new creation is all about, you begin to get a picture, and you can begin to understand this absolutely takes the power of God to produce. Because, again, uh, God's kingdom is a kingdom of power to produce everything that God has purposed to produce uh, uh, in us, his sons and daughters, that are to be led by the Spirit of God. True Christians, and, and again, uh, every one of these things I'm giving to you, every characteristic of a true Christian it is right here in the New Testament. It's right here. There's passages of scriptures that declare these things as practical realities. Uh, in the true sons and daughters of God. True Christian is somebody that is born of God by the Holy Spirit. A true Christian is, it has a new heart. They have a new spirit. They're, they're, they're not of the old heart of sin anymore. They're not of that old spirit of selfishness and, and uh, pride and, and lust. Uh, we have a new heart and a new spirit. We have the mind of Christ. Uh, a true Christian has been cleansed uh, uh, from all sin. They have purified hearts. They've been circumcised by the hands of Christ. They are filled and led by the Holy Spirit. They have overcome the world and all of its lust of the eyes and lust of the flesh and pride of life. They, they no longer live in willful known sin. True Christians are dead to sin and they are alive unto God. They are filled with the love of God and they live in that love uh, towards God and towards others. They have been washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. Again, it takes power. It takes, it takes God's power to bring us into this newness of life, this new creation 
whereby we exude, we, we exemplify these characteristics that the gospel declares uh, would be produced in the true sons and daughters of God. We as Christians know the voice of God and we follow Jesus Christ. We no longer live for ourselves, but for the one who died for us. Uh, we are bought with a price and we know it. And now we uh, live to honor and glorify God in our bodies and our spirits. And you can go on and on. There's just a multitude of scriptures that talk about the reality of a true born-again child of God and what it should look like, what, what, what should be produced, the fruits that should be manifested in that life. But you'll notice that every one of these characteristics are practical realities in the life of a born-again Christian produced by the power of God through the, through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ as revealed again through these scriptures. And so we want to look at, into this word again uh, uh, as we continue this study, a kingdom of power. Uh, because again, uh, when we look at today's church, we're not seeing the reality of these things as we see in the New Testament church. Uh, they demonstrated the early church before the church began to get corrupted and uh, and. Uh, 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 Paul had to deal with a lot of sin in the church and had to deal with a lot of uh, uh, false gospels, false uh, uh, pro uh, uh, teachers and prophets and uh, uh, false Jesus, a uh, uh, false spirit. Uh, he had to deal with a lot of things that started to get into the church uh, after the first uh, a few uh, decades of the church operating. But when you look at the first church, look at the early church, uh, they... Uh, showed forth. They manifested the reality of all of these practical things that were worked in their lives from the very uh, moment that they were born again, that the Spirit of God came and redeemed them by the blood of a lamb and changed them into this new creation. And that's why when you look at that church, that's what it talks about. They continued in the things of God. They lived in the Word. They lived in prayer, in worship. Uh, they, they were out making disciples. They lived in fellowship. They revealed the love for the, of, of, of Christ in their hearts for God. They, loved the, they showed forth their love towards one another, even selling what they had to make sure there was no need in the body of Christ. You could go on and on and on. They lived and died for Christ, never denying their faith. Even in, in a time when Christianity... Uh, was trying to be wiped out by the Romans, by, by the Judaizers, and uh, just every, every evil thing was coming against that early church. And they suffered persecution like we've never seen or known uh, in our lifetime. They were martyred for their faith, but they never did denied Jesus Christ because they experienced this work in a real and practical way. They were truly made into a new creation. They lived it out. They walked it out. And... Uh, uh, they gave evidence. Uh, uh, they showed forth the, the fruits of a true born-again disciple of Jesus. And uh, we need to get back to that. We need to restore the foundations of righteousness and justice. We need to go back to the good old ways uh, of coming to, to Jesus Christ and surrender through the cross of Christ by the blood of a lamb and receive the full redemptive work. Now, we've been looking at these scriptures to, to see uh, uh, God's calling to every one of us to be the disciples of Jesus, that we are to come the same way that Jesus came, through the cross, through our death, burial, and resurrection, through the denial of ourselves, through taking up that cross to follow Him, through, through our, our devotion and consecration, purification, sanctification. Uh, we are to walk as Jesus walked, free from the power of sin, free from a, a life of willful sin. And as we look through these scriptures, I, I just want to really emphasize the practical reality of all of these things we're talking about, that every scripture that we look at is talking about a practical reality, not just some, uh, some facade. That's called hypocrisy. One thing Jesus didn't put up with, I mean, you know, he, he ministered to sinners and he forgave them. He said, go and sin no more. But when it came to hypocrites, Jesus, uh, I mean, he blasted them. He, he got on those Pharisees and Sadducees. He called them whitewashed tombs. He says, outwardly, you look good. You, you, got, you, know, you got a form of godliness. You, you look righteous outside. But inside, you're full of hypocrisy. You're full of uncleanness, like dead men's bones. And, and uh, he just rebuked them. And uh, one of the things Jesus said, hypocrites will not enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because the work that Jesus did on that cross is supposed to produce 
a real and practical work in every one of God's children that by faith come to Him in repentance and faith and receive the redemptive work of Christ. That there would not be hypocrisy, it would be reality uh, rooted again in the power of God, the power of that blood, the power of the cross, the power of the gospel. Uh, it would actually produce that work in us. And uh, that's what we're looking at. And that's what we really need to get back to because, again, so many in the body of Christ today do not believe uh, in that practical reality. And we're just like Paul talks about in Second Timothy chapter 3 uh, when he was talking about the last day church. He said, the last days, dangerous times will come. Why? Because many, many, many in the body of Christ will have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of of God to produce that godliness and that's exactly what we're seeing today they love righteousness they love pleasure more than than God and uh, they, they bring all kinds of false doctrine they bring all kinds of junk uh, into uh, uh, the church and uh, Paul rebuked them for that he said we shouldn't even be around people like that that's the hypocrisy so let's look at these scriptures where we left off from before in John chapter 12 verse 23 through 26 Jesus said this he answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Now, Jesus was, was literally talking about his own death. Uh, through his death, that he was able to produce much grain, much fruit. And uh, in John uh, he talks about this same thing, uh, that, that the purpose, one of the purposes of his death uh, was to, to uh, bring many brethren, many people in his own image, in his own likeness, that would carry on the work that he was doing. Because Jesus, when he was in the flesh, could only be in one place at a time. He could only minister to, to uh, uh, small areas, small groups of people, whatever. Uh, uh, he didn't have the capability of being everywhere at all times and, and reach everybody uh, because of his physical body. But through his death, burial, and resurrection, he could reproduce himself in others. And that's exactly why he died, exactly what he came to do, to produce his image in us so that instead of just him and his physical body being able to go here and there and reach a very limited number of people, he could reproduce himself in his church, in us, individually. And by doing so, uh, he could be everywhere in this world and reach the entire world to carry on the Father's will, to seek and save that which is lost, to be that witness, to make disciples of all peoples, all nations, everywhere. And, and that's what he came to do. And uh, again, uh, he calls us to go through that same process so that we can reproduce Christ in others also. We are to go through that same, uh, uh, Jesus says, uh, unless a grain of wheat falls in the ground, it dies or it remains alone. We too must die with Christ. That's part of that redemptive process, that we are crucified with Christ, that we no longer live, but Christ lives in us. Uh, that we go through that same process of death, burial, and resurrection so that we can come forth in this new glorified life of Christ and reproduce uh, Him in others uh, so that the, 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 the body of Christ can multiply as His people go forth and do the same works uh, that He did. Now notice what He continues to say in this uh, verse in John chapter 12, verse 23 to 26. He, after telling us this, that uh, He has to die... Uh, so that it can produce much grain. And uh, that's our purpose. We've talked about this before. Uh, our purpose is to multiply. Uh, in John, he tells us, He who bears much fruit glorifies the Father. Uh, that's our purpose. And uh, in Romans, uh, uh, he tells us, or rather, or rather Hebrews, I'm sorry, he tells us, he sanctifies us for the purpose of bringing forth many brethren, bringing forth many people in his own image and character to, to, to carry on the work that he began. But notice what he tells us here. If he tells us we, we, have to, we have to die in order to produce fruit. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, you have to really look at this scripture because this is real serious. 
Notice what he says. He who loves his life. In other words, he who, who wants to live his own life. In other words, the person that wants to to uh, do his own will, do his own thing, live for himself, continue in this life of selfishness and self-seeking and self-glory and all of these things. He, he says uh, uh, he's going to lose his life. He's going to lose it. But he who hates his life in this world, knows we recognize we're not citizens of this world anymore. We are born again as citizens of, of heaven. We are of another kingdom and another world. And because of that, because we understand as Christians, this world lies in wickedness. The prince of the power of the air is ruling uh, in this world through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's why we see all this wickedness around us. But he tells us we understand that and we hate uh, 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 the, our life in this world because that's where we were. That Paul talks about many times. I once was before I was born again, before God took a hold of me and changed me. That's the way we all were. We were walking and living in the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, the lust of the eyes. We lived for ourselves. We lived in selfishness. We lived for wickedness, for pleasure, for sin. And uh, it's increasing. It's getting worse every day today. We're seeing it abounding every place you look. But notice what he says. But, but he who hates his life in this world, who recognizes this is not my life anymore. I, I've got a new life. Uh, I, I give up my life. I lay down my life. I put it on the cross I left that. It was dead and buried. And I have been brought forth into newness of life. This new life of the Holy Spirit. He says, we'll keep it for eternal life. What's he talking about? No, notice when he says losing his life and keeping your life. Okay? We have to relate that to, he's saying if you keep your life, it's for eternal life. Well, what does that mean then when you lose your life? It means eternal damnation. He's not talking about losing some kind of reward or something. He says if we're going to, to uh, 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 love our life and live for ourselves, uh, we're going to lose eternal life. We're not going to have that eternal life. We will not uh, attain to the kingdom of God because to attain to the kingdom of God means uh, that God's redemptive work is, has brought us into this new life and we live for God now. We, we have a different way of thinking, a different way of doing and acting, and everything about us is new. The old is gone, and the new has come in a practical and real way. So he says, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. You see, Jesus is the head. He's, he's the preeminent one. You can't serve him unless you're going to follow him. Amen? And to follow him, you have to listen to his voice. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. Uh, that means we live in an abiding relationship with Him. We live in this intimacy with Him. We listen to His voice. We obey Him. We do what He says. To follow Him means that you obey Him, that you do the things He commands us to do. And and what did Jesus come to do? He came to seek and save up His lost. He came to fulfill the will of the Father. He's calling us to that same practical reality. We're to walk just as Jesus walked. We're to do as Jesus did. Uh, that's what he came to produce in us through his redemptive work. And he says, where I am, there my servant will be also. So whatever Jesus is doing, where is Jesus? He goes into the fields of harvest. He goes out to make disciples. He goes out to, to reach the lost. He goes out to heal the sick, to drive out demons, to preach the gospel, to teach, uh, uh, to minister to the poor. We're to be doing the same things. Why? Because he's supposed to have produced himself in us given us that same heart, that new heart, that new spirit to do the same things that he did and even greater works because now uh, there's so many more of us. He says, if anyone serves me, my father will honor. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Uh, uh, because again, uh, we, are to, it, we, we live to do the will of the father. We exist to fulfill his will. And uh, that's serious. That's very serious. In fact, if you go back to Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, notice what Jesus said. Many will say in, the, in that day, Lord, Lord. And uh, Jesus is going to say, I don't know you. And the reason that he gives that he doesn't know you, the reason that he gives that uh, we can say, Lord, Lord, all we want. We can even do the works of the ministry. But he says, I don't know you. And the reason is uh, because... We have not done the will of the Father. And he calls us lawless. He says you're lawless. You are not walking under the headship of Christ. You're not living under the authority of him who you claim to be your Lord. Like Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say do? That that's just doesn't make sense. I'm not your Lord if you won't obey me. 
Uh, and so, again, but we need to see the reality of this, that everything he's talking about is supposed to be a reality. It should be something that is practically produced in every child of God by the power of God when he redeems you. So in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 27, notice what Jesus says. And, and, and he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Now, right here, we see the whole purpose of the cross of Jesus Christ, the whole purpose of his death, the whole purpose of Jesus willingly come to fulfill the will of God, to die on the cross. Notice what he says, this was the purpose of the cross, that he might sanctify. That word sanctify means to make holy, that he might make holy, having washed her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself. Talking about the church. Jesus died on the cross for this purpose, to make us holy. Now notice what he says, that he might present us, the church, to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. What's he saying? Through the redemptive work of Christ, his purpose to die on that cross was to provide a sacrificial blood that has the power to wash and cleanse us from all sin and to bring us forth into this newness of life whereby we would be a holy, a glorious church without spot or blemish that we would be practically, literally a new creation free from the power of sin, uh, washed and clean, purified hearts, uh, with a new heart, a new spirit, with the Holy Spirit, uh, doing the things that Jesus called us to do. Uh, we, we don't go about, we don't live in willful known sin anymore. Again, we're talking about a practical reality. Every one of these scriptures you'll see, he uses words, he uses phrases, he uses passages of scripture to make it clear. He's talking about this gospel is a gospel of power. It has the power of God himself. There's power in that blood. Uh, listen, John declared this. He says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now listen. <clears throat> if Jesus' death, if, if His sacrificial, uh, uh, coming as a sacrificial Lamb to die on that cross could take away the sin of the entire world. We're talking about from beginning to end. I mean, taking away all sin. If it could take away the entire sin of the world, don't you think he can take your sin away? Don't you think that it has enough power to take your sin away? That's what he's talking about. This is supposed to be a reality. That's why Jesus said you'll know them by their fruits. They're not going to look like that, that old man anymore. They're not going to act like that old man anymore. They're not going to be like that old man. Why? Because when Jesus takes your sin away, he makes you into a saint. He, he makes you holy. He makes you without spot or blemish. He, he makes you clean uh, and, 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 and no more spots, no more wrinkles. Everything is made new. Okay, And what is the purpose? 1 Peter 2.21. Notice what Peter says. For to this you were called. This is your calling. This was the purpose of your salvation. Uh, because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. You should follow his steps. Okay? And we looked at this also in 1 John 2, 6. John says the same thing. Whoever claims to abide in him. If you, if you claim to abide in Christ, then you ought to walk just as he walked. Why? Because that's what it means to be born again. That's what it means to be redeemed by the blood of a lamb. We walk like Jesus walked. We do the things that Jesus did. We, we talk like Jesus. We act like Jesus. Why? Because he makes us into his image. He makes us in the character, in the moral character of Christ, and he empowers us uh, with his spirit to do the things that he called us to do. First Peter 2.24, Peter tells us this, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Again, what was the purpose of the cross? What was the purpose of the death of Jesus Christ on that cross? Okay, it was to do what? To bear our sins. In other words, to take our sins away, to remove our sins. Why? What was the purpose of that? That we, having died to sins, okay, just like Jesus, we died to sins, might live for righteousness. 
There it is again. And notice the word he uses, might live. In other words, again, he's talking about a practical reality. We live, we walk in righteousness. Why? Because we are righteous in a real and practical way through this redemptive work of Christ. Every single uh, passage that talks about this redemptive work is talking about a redemptive work that produces a practical reality by the power of God. It's a kingdom of power. And that power is something we can't even comprehend uh, with these human minds. It is so great. Galatians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. Notice what Paul says about his own personal experience. He says, For I through the law died to the Lord. Law, Why? That I might live to God. That I might live to God. Again, walking, doing, being. Amen. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. There it is. I died with Christ. Why? Like Jesus said, that, that we might produce much grain, except the corn of wheat falls on the ground and dies. It remains alone. But if we die, we can produce much grain. How much grain did Paul produce? How many churches did Paul plant? How many souls came to Christ through, through the ministry of Paul? Why? Because he died with Christ. He was crucified with Christ. He embraced the redemptive work of Christ. And what does he say? It's no longer I who live. My old man, my old self, that's gone. That, that, that was put on the cross with Christ. It's dead. It's buried. It's been cut off, circumcised uh, by the hands of Christ. It, 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 it's been cut off. He says, it's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me now. Okay, that was the whole purpose of Jesus sanctifying the church. He went to the cross in order to make us holy. Why? To make us a temple. For God to live in us. For Christ to come and live inside of us by His Spirit. Remember we talked about all those Old Testament saints, all those mighty men and women of God. We look at Abraham and, and Isaac and Jacob. We look at David and, and, and Samson. I mean, you go go through all the great men and women of God. Just read Hebrews chapter 11. But what was the problem? They couldn't, they, they couldn't receive the promise. They could not have God dwell inside of them. They couldn't receive the Holy Spirit inside of them to give them the promise of eternal life. Why? Because they didn't have the power the law was not able to make them holy. It didn't have the power to deal with the inward sin of man, to, to get down into the root, the root problem of that sin nature. It couldn't do that. So therefore, God couldn't dwell in him. He had to dwell in an outward temple. He had to dwell in, 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 a, in a holy of holies built by men because uh, he couldn't dwell inside of them until Jesus came with a blood sacrifice that was able to, to go through down inside of man and touch the very root of his problem, that heart of sin, and, and cleanse that thing out of man to make us a holy temple so God could come and dwell in us. And like Paul says, because I have, have, have received the work of Christ in me, I've been crucified with Christ, I no longer live. Christ lives in me now. It's Christ in me doing the works. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory. It's Christ in me that's, that's bringing the fruits, the increase, that's empowering me to do the things that I do. That's why he says I can do all things, things through Christ. That says I count, I, I count my sufferings as nothing. Uh, why? Because of the glory that's been set before me. Everything about Paul was the understanding that, that his, he didn't live for himself anymore. He had the same mind of Christ. He had the same attitude of Christ. He, he lived, he existed. Everything he was about was doing the will of the Father through the power of Christ in him. He says, the life which I now live in the flesh, the life I now live, now that I've been redeemed, now that I've been changed into this new creation, the life I now live uh, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, we talked about in Hebrews, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. What are we living by faith about? What's it all about? We live by faith in the Son of God. We live every single day, every moment by faith of Jesus Christ. That's who our life is. And thereby, uh, our trust, our, our future, our hopes, our dreams, our strength, everything is in Him. We draw upon Him for everything we do in this life. And that's what Paul was talking about. That's how he did what he did. That's how he lived the way he did and went through the sufferings that he went through. Just like Peter says, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving an example. 
He left us an example. You may have to suffer in this life. You may have to go so, through some things in this life to do what God called you to do. And that's what Paul was talking about. He suffered for Christ. You just read the letters that Paul talks about, and he suffered in every imaginable way you can think of. And uh, uh, again, but look at the fruits that he bore. Look at what he produced, uh, uh, th Christ produced through him, through his life, uh, that was given up. Uh, he lost his life. He gave up this life. He, he didn't love this world. He, he loved the world that was to come. And he gave up his life in order that he might have eternal life. And that's what we're talking about. Again, notice the practical reality. Paul walked it out. He lived it. Not in his own strength. Not because, you know, of what he did. Because of Christ in him. And that's what I'm talking about. When we look at the church today and we look at the church in the first century, in, in the early days, the, 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 the first church, you can see a big difference because we're not seeing the reality today that we see in the early church. And again, why? Because we have rejected this gospel of practical reality. We have, we have accepted a form rather than the power we, we have uh, uh, rejected uh, the truth of the power of that blood to make us into new creation, to deliver us and cleanse us from all sin. Uh, many don't even, don't even believe, don't even preach that anymore. Uh, you hear more and more preachers going by the experience of, of what's around them. They see so many professing believers living in sin. So they say, that must be natural. That must be just the way it is. Well, when you look at the early church, uh, that was rebuked. That was totally rejected. That was a lie from the pit of hell. That was a, a false doctrine of demons because, again, they understood this gospel, the power of this gospel to make us a practical reality, a new creation in Christ that walk in newness of life, that live newness of life, like Paul, that, that uh, live a life in the flesh by faith in the Son of God, which empowered them to do whatever needed to be done and to live the way they needed to live to show forth the fruits uh, of this new creation in the name of Jesus. In John chapter 8, verse 34, notice what Jesus said. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Now, he's not talking about a you know, one-time sin. He's not talking about uh, a, a mistake. He's not talking about you know, doing something out of ignorance. He is talking about whoever commits sin, whoever lives in willful, known, habitual sin is a slave of sin. In other words, what he is saying is, you are under the power of sin. Now, you could, you could also just say this. You're under the power of the prince of the power of the air because uh, he is the one who controls the sons of disobedience. And you read that in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 2. You'll see there that those people that are walking in the lust of their flesh, they are still like, like, uh, uh, Peter, uh, 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 like John talked about. They refuse to give up their life. They want to live this life of the world. They want to live for the lust of the flesh, the, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Uh, he tells us that the prince of the power of the air is working in them, and uh, uh, they are under his power. And that's what he's talking about here. Uh, Jesus is saying, whoever is living... Uh, in uh, habitual sin is a slave of sin. You are, un you are enslaved uh, to Satan. You are enslaved to the power of that sin. And he says this, a slave does not reside in the house forever. You will not, you will not be in the kingdom of God. You cannot, you cannot bring sin into the kingdom of God. Go, go read Revelation 21, 22. You will see there is nothing that defiles. There is no sin that's going to get into heaven. God gave man a free will. But when man brought sin into this creation, and he, he contaminated, he, he flooded this entire creation with sin, with impurity, God said, that's not going to happen again. That will not happen to heaven. Uh, this, this, next, this next stage of, of this uh, eternal life in heaven with God will not be defiled by any sin. If you don't have your sin dealt with at the cross of Christ, uh, you're not getting into the kingdom of God. And, and again... Uh, you can read uh, uh, many, 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 many scriptures that uh, uh, deal with that issue. But just go read Revelation 21 and 22, and you'll see very plainly in there 
Nothing that defiles, nothing that has not been washed in the blood of a lamb is going to get in to the kingdom of God. It's that simple. You will not defile that new kingdom. Uh, when everything's said and done, there's got, not going to be anything but righteousness uh, in heaven, in the kingdom of God. But look what Jesus says. A slave does not abide in the house. If you're enslaved to sin, you cannot remain in the house of God. But a son abides forever. Who are the sons of God? In Romans chapter 8, the sons of God are those who are led by the Spirit of God. You don't live for yourself, you live for God. You're led by the Spirit of God. What does the Holy Spirit do? He does the will of the Father. Everything the Holy Spirit does is for and by and of and through the Father. It's the Father's will. He makes you to the praise of His glory. Uh, again, if you're truly being led by the Spirit of God, you are not living in sin. Let's put it that way. The Holy Ghost does not sin. Amen. But look what he says. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, makes you free from what? From the power of sin. If the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. What does that mean? You will be free practically forever, entirely, completely, indeed. There's no doubt about it. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Why? Because He came. Read it. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. He came with His blood to do what? To take your sin away. To wash you of all sin and all of its defilement. He came. He shed His blood outside the camp to do what? To sanctify you with His own blood. To make you holy with His own blood. Meaning to purify your heart from that sin so that you are no longer a sinner but you become the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. And the life you now live with Him, you live in this flesh, you live by faith in the Son of God to do the things that God has called you to do. And that's what it's all about. That's, that's what Jesus came to do. But again, the emphasis we're trying to get you to see, the emphasis with the church is so missing, is that this should be a practical reality in the life of every truly born-again saint of God. And when you look at all the scriptures, line upon line, precept upon precept, that's why when, when I share the word, I share the word. I give you scripture after scripture after scripture. Why? Because you need to be like the Bereans. Don't go by what somebody tells you. You look it up for yourself. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you the revelation and uh, give you uh, the understanding and see for yourself. Amen? Because until the Father gives you the revelation, that word's not going to come flesh and produce something in you. It's like Jesus told uh, uh, the disciples, you know, who do you say I am? And then Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And what did Jesus says? Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Only God can make, make known to you the reality, the truth that will set you free. And uh, that revelation, when it sets you free, it makes you into a new creation. It removes all that old self-life, all the lust, uh, all the pride. Uh, you go back to Ezekiel 36. Says, he takes away all your idolatry. He removes all your transgression, all your filthiness. He washes everything away. He cuts out that stony heart of flesh. He removes that hardness of heart. He gives you a new heart, a new spirit. And then to make sure that you have what it takes to continue on, he puts his spirit in you. And He empowers you. He puts the love of Christ in your heart. He puts the Word in your heart and in your mind. And He empowers you to do what? To walk in obedience and to fulfill all these things that He's called us to do. That's called grace by faith. And that's what Paul's talking about. Once you've been crucified with Christ, the life that you now live in this flesh, you live by faith in the Son of God. You walk day by day, believing Him, following Him, listening to His voice, trusting Him, talking to Him, and... Uh, 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 letting Him fulfill His will and purpose through your life, uh, that you live for Him. You no longer live for self and sin, you now live for God. You're dead to sin and alive unto God. To be alive unto God means everything about you is about Him, just like Jesus was. He came to sanctify us, and Lord, to do what? To produce many brethren, to produce many people that are just like Him, so that we can, we can do the things that Jesus did and bring forth His glorious church, His holy bride upon this church. We can seek and save that which is lost, and uh, we can make disciples of all nations. Amen. Well, listen, I look and I'm, I'm looking here, and I see them. I'm running out of time, and uh, uh, I hope that you're 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 hearing this. I, I hope that you're you're receiving from this uh, because this is so vital to the church today. And uh, I just again want to encourage you. Uh, look at this video again. 
and write down the scriptures. And then, and then when you have time, get alone with the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit open your eyes to see the truth and to uh, grasp a hold of it. And when you look into the mirror of the Word and you don't see this practical reality in your own life, you don't have that, uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, deadness to this world. Uh, you don't have that uh, love of this world, of its pleasure. Uh, you, you just have a form of godliness, but the reality is not there. Then don't be condemned because, again, that's why Jesus came. He died on the cross to sanctify you, to make you holy, to, to purify you, to separate you, and to consecrate you to the will and purpose of God. And then once he's made you holy, he tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that he'll preserve you in holiness uh, to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will preserve you in that place of separation and purification and, and consecration. He will keep you by his great power, the same power that, that saves you, the same power that raised up Christ from the dead and raises us up uh, from that dead, uh, uh, from from that death uh, with Christ into this newness of life, the same power that's going to change us, uh, uh, our physical bodies, uh, into glorious bodies, that same power uh, is given to us uh, to do this work. Uh, but again, it takes uh, God's grace. It takes uh, revelation of the promises of God uh, to do this in you. And I just want to encourage you. Uh, don't be disappointed. Don't be uh, uh, condemned. Just get in the Word and the Holy Spirit and ask God to show you the truth that will set you free because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And that means it's done, it's finished, it's over. And now you no longer live for sin or self. You now live for God. And, and uh, you will receive, like Jesus said, uh, you will receive what uh, uh, the Father, the, uh, the Father will honor you. He will honor you. <laughs> Praise God. Wouldn't you like to be honored by God? Wouldn't you like to get up there and, and God says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that every hearer of this word of truth will receive it and embrace it, that it will convict that, Lord God, as we, as we read early in Thessalonians, that uh, we receive it as the Word of God that works effectively in those who believe. I pray, O oh God, that you circumcise every ear, put the salve upon every eye, and Lord God, bring the revelation to set your people free from the power of sin, that we will be dead to sin and alive unto you, that you will have a glorious church at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he can present to himself a church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, a church that is holy and blameless, watching and waiting for your coming, doing the things you've called us to do. God, I pray. Bring forth, bring the church back to the reality of the cross, back to the reality of this gospel of power, the reality of the power that's in that blood to make us into a new creation and to remove every spot and blemish of sin in the name of Jesus Christ. Wash us again, O God, and bring forth, restore the zeal, the passion, the fervency, restore the love for your word, for your true disciples, and bring forth a true church full of disciples, making known this glorious uh, salvation to everybody around us uh, before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, I thank you for it. I lift up those, Lord, that are suffering right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, I speak life and healing to everybody, every mind. I bind the forces of darkness coming against anybody in the name of Jesus Christ. I cast down every demon in Jesus' name. I bind every spirit of infirmity, sickness, disease, death, and destruction coming against your people in Jesus' name. We break the yoke of the enemy. We declare life and healing. We thank you, Lord. You forgive all our sins and heal all our diseases that by his stripes we are healed. That is the children's bread. It is our basic right as the children of God. And we declare, we proclaim Jehovah Rapha, the Lord your healer, over you right now. Be made whole in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This is George Della, Power for Today Prophetic Ministries. I'm coming to you today from Latrobe, Pennsylvania. I'm out of town uh, from my home uh, to bring you the Word of God. We are going to be back on the third Tuesday of April, same time. You can join me on Facebook at 735, and uh, we're going to continue to proclaim the truth of this gospel of power. It is a kingdom of power. Everything about it is the power of God. And I want to encourage you tonight, keep looking up because your redemption draws nigh. The Lord's coming soon. Make sure, make sure you're ready. 
We love you. We bless you. And uh, I, I, I just throw out my my uh, greetings to all of you, uh, leaving messages on there. I, I, I bless you, and uh, uh, we love all of you. Uh, have a blessed week, and uh, get along with God, and, and let's do the things He's called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.